did his original uh, medical training in, in Syria and then did his uh, internal medicine at the Mayo Clinic and uh, came to Emory as a cardiology fellow, stayed on for advanced training in uh, advanced heart failure and transplantation as well as adult uh, congenital heart disease. He is uh, one of our adult congenital heart disease physicians and also does heart failure and transplantation. He's one of our great bedside teachers and clinicians and has won uh, teaching awards from our fellows even while he was still technically a trainee, which was interesting. Um, <coughs> today he's going to give uh, a talk that's uh, a little different. It, uh, is you're not going to see any Western blots or PCRs or meta-analyses. Uh, it's more of an uh, historical talk, but I think one that can help us guide us in our practice. Bon? I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to share with you some stories. Stories from history about four presidents and about one princess who many of you may not have heard about. The medical care these patients received altered the course of history. I feel that there are lessons to be learned from the care these patients received and I feel that these lessons are applicable to the way we care for patients every day. I have no conflicts of interest, uh, not for lack of trying. <laughs> so Eleanor Roosevelt said, learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. And this is what this talk is about. It's about learning from the mistakes as well as the triumphs of others and I uh, hope you'll find this talk interesting. One of these three people, one of these three leaders, has pulses alternans the day this photograph was taken. Pulses alternans, you may recall, is alternating the intensity of the pulse. Pulsus alternans is present in severe cardiomyopathy and when present portends a poor prognosis. In fact the person with pulsus alternans in this photograph was dead within two months. This was a very important meeting. This was the Yalta conference that occurred in February of 1945. The person with pulsus alternans in this photograph was FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, sitting in the middle. He was dead in two months. To his right is Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, and to his left, the guy with the big mustache, is Joseph Stalin, the Russian Premier, uh, Soviet Premier. So on that morning, Franklin Roosevelt had a long trip to Yalta. He felt awful. He looked gray. His doctor, Dr. Ross McIntyre, examined him. Ross McIntyre was an ENT specialist. And he examined him, and he found the pulses paradoxus. He found the blood pressure to be very elevated. And he prescribed a cigarette and a back rub. And the president's condition improved to the point where he was now feeling well enough to go to this historic meeting. Though he felt good, he was unfit for duty on this day and he made enormous concessions, enormous concessions to Stalin. And this changed the face of Europe and changed the face of Asia. And we feel the reverberations to this day. This meeting heralded the Cold War. So the learning objectives for this talk are to recognize the VIP syndrome and in this situation VIP is not what you might think it is. Understand why VIP patients are at risk for receiving substandard medical care and recognize the factors that lead a physician to go against their own medical judgment. So Eleanor Mariano, who was the White House physician 
for both Bushes and for Clinton, defined the VIP as a very intimidating patient. Very intimidating patient. An example of a very intimidating patient would be, well, politicians, celebrities, wealthy people, someone you might want to get a chairmanship from, friends, neighbors, family, other physicians. Even you may consider in this category that patient who is very difficult and demanding, who you are ready to appease just to get them out of your hair. That could be considered a VIP patient. So when you have VIP syndrome, the physician goes against their own medical judgment. And this makes a VIP a vulnerable patient. And when you have VIP syndrome, and when the doctor goes against their own medical judgment, you have deviation of the standard of care. So my take home message really is don't be persuaded against using your medical judgment. So with that out of the way, let's get to some stories. I love to tell stories. I love to read stories. That's why I enjoy history. The best stories are in history, and you just can't make them up. And hopefully you'll enjoy some of these stories. So Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt, the 32nd President of the United States, was born in Hyde Park in the lap of luxury. He was uh, well-bred, uh, well-fed, uh, and a uh, very affluent family from New York. And uh, he married his third cousin, Eleanor Roosevelt. His family's side of the family were the Roosevelt's, and her family were the Roosevelt's. Uh, I'm not sure if she changed her name after their marriage in 1905. This is at Campobello Island. This is where he contracted polio, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So he was a rising star in the Democratic Party. All the other Roosevelt's were Republicans, but he declared he was a Democrat because there was less competition on that side of the, of the aisle. Um, he was Assistant Secretary to the Navy, which was a position held by his cousin Teddy. And then he made a run for the vice presidency that uh, did not work out in 1920. And then in 1921, he developed polio in the summer of 1921. He was on this island, Campobella Island. There was actually a movie about this, uh, about this in 1960 called Campobella Island, or Sunrise at Campobello. And he had a, um, a little cottage, a little 34-bedroom cottage on that island. And, um, and this is where he uh, liked to summer. And one day on August 11th, he was swimming in this lake. He put out a fire somewhere around here. And he was jogging and enjoying time with his family. And he ran back to the cottage around there. That evening, he didn't feel well. He had some back pain. And he retired early. The next day, he had a high fever and he had lost the use of his left leg. This quickly developed into rapid ascending paralysis associated with fever. At first, a doctor was summoned and the doctor said this is the cold. There were no polio epidemics at the time. He quickly lost the use of his legs. His arms were weak. He lost control of his bladder and bowel and he needed a urinary catheter and enemas, and he was transferred to New York Presbyterian Hospital. After some weeks, his arm weakness improved, and his, uh, his bowel function uh, and urinary function also returned to normal, but he was permanently paralyzed from the, uh, from the waist down. There were no iron lungs at that time, so he came very close to death at that time. So he felt that his political career was over. He didn't feel that a cripple could be elected to office. He didn't think that people would ever vote for him again. And so his political career was over. And he entered a period of despondency and depression, but never lost hope, and kept looking for solutions, ways 
uh, to regain the use of his legs. So he went to this little town, which was later named Warm Springs, Georgia. It's about two hours away from here. And in this, in this town, there are springs, and the temperature is always 88 degrees year-round. And there's very high mineral density in these waters. And there was a myth that somebody, a kid, was able to walk after being paralyzed from polio after walking in these waters. So he wanted to explore this idea. He went to swim with the other people, but they were uncomfortable with a patient who had polio swimming with them. So he felt some discrimination, and what he did was he just bought the place. Um, he purchased the Meriwether uh, Inn and surrounding farm in 1927, and this became the first ever rehabilitation facility, which still stands today, and this is the Warm Springs Institute of Rehabilitation. And he started to rehab himself, and uh, he had some success, and people were hearing of this, and so polio patients were coming from near and far. It didn't matter if you couldn't pay. Franklin Roosevelt would still, uh, would still help you at that time. He developed some close relationships with patients and locals. When he first moved there, he found his energy bill was astronomical, much higher than what he paid in New York. And this is because the area was underserved. There were no, there were no electrical lines in the area. And he um, experienced the, he saw the poverty uh, that was there in, uh, in, that, in that part of the country at the time. And his experiences would later help him develop the March of Dimes, which would uh, raise money for polio research, and the rural electrification system, which we'll talk about later, gave uh, LBJ his start in politics. And so he regained some use of his legs. He was able to disguise his disability with braces. He had enough strength to use a cane and support of a friend or a colleague to walk a few steps. And he walked to his inauguration a few steps here in 1933. First, he was elected to, after political revival, he was elected to the governorship of New York, and then he became uh, President of the United States in 1933. He took over the presidency when America was in the throes of its worst depression. One in four Americans were out of work, and many others had jobs that paid too little. And uh, either because or in spite of his uh, Keynesian high government spending alphabet soup policies, there was some recovery of, uh, of the uh, U.S. economy within, within a few months, uh, but obviously the recovery did not, was not complete until until the Second World War. He did okay during his pregnancy, but in 1941, he was profoundly anemic. <clears throat> his hemoglobin here was 4.5, and this was attributed to hemorrhoids. And he was treated with iron. Here he's admitted under a pseudonym to the Naval Hospital, FDR. His doctor at the time was Dr. Ross McIntyre, who was head of the Bethesda Naval Hospital, ear, eye, and nose, and throat uh, 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 chief there. You may wonder, why was an ENT the president's physician? And that's because despite having polio, despite having very high blood pressure, the president's main concerns were his sinuses. And so Dr. McIntyre would come once, twice, three times a day to the White House and administer local therapies to the president's sinuses. You gotta wonder, could local decongestants with such frequency have contributed to the president's hypertension? And then in early 1944, near the end of his third term, he developed orthopnea, dyspnea. He was on three, four pillows, upright to sleep, very uncomfortable. Dr. McIntyre attributed this to the flu, but this lasted for weeks. FDR's family were 
not satisfied with this explanation, they admitted him to the Bethesda Naval Hospital and they consulted with Dr. Bruin, who was a cardiologist at the time. Dr. Bruin found cardiomegaly on a chest X-ray, a gallop on physical exam, and crackles in the lungs. And he recommended mercury salts to diuresis. There was no Lasix at that time. And he recommended digitalis to the objection of Dr. McIntyre. McIntyre did not, did not want uh, to hear of Dig. There are still naysayers to this day about digoxin. Um, it's a private joke with a heart failure crew. So, um, so digoxin was finally administered after the patient's condition further worsened. And this was an instantaneous, dramatic improvement in his symptoms. And he was finally discharged from the hospital. And now, here we have a president in his third term contemplating a fourth term. The 22nd Amendment would not be passed until the Eisenhower administration. 22nd Amendment limits a uh, uh, president to two terms of office. So they consulted with some civilian experts. And they consulted first with Dr. Frank Leahy, who founded the Leahy Clinic. He was chief of surgery simultaneously at both Tufts and Harvard. He was a remarkable man. And Leahy was very clear. He said, no way. He said, you're too sick. You would not survive a fourth term in office. So they went looking for second opinion, third opinion, fourth opinion. And then they found Dr. James Edgar Pollan, who was a giant in Emory history. He was the first chief of, of medicine, considered the first chief of medicine before Eugene Stead here at Emory. He had trained with Osler at Johns Hopkins, and uh, he was very well known, respected teacher. There's a scholarship named after Pollan for the medical students. Uh, there is a ward here at Emory uh, with his name. His portrait is up on the fourth floor just outside the Hearst Conference Room. Uh, very well respected man. Dr. Pollan publicly encouraged the president to run for a fourth term in office. Dr. Pollan did not verbalize any concerns about the patient's health. I'm not sure why this was. Clearly, he was one of the eminent physicians of his day. And so, FDR runs for a fourth, fourth term. He dumps Wallace and picks up Truman, and they uh, win in a landslide. At this point in time, the Second World War appears to be nearing its conclusion. At this point in time, the invasion of Europe appears to be successful. The fall of Berlin is imminent within a few months. At this point in time, the Japanese are eventually going to fall, but at tremendous loss of life. And so the Allies needed to meet. And so they had to meet, and they had met at various places in the past. But on this occasion, Stalin refused to leave his domain. And the furthest west he would go was Yalta. This is where the Tsars holidayed, and he stayed, uh, and he stayed, um, and he stayed there. Franklin Roosevelt had a very long trip. Winston Churchill had a very long trip. And here you have Winston Churchill hobbling down. He's 80 years old. Here's Winston Churchill with Russia's Molotov. Here you have a cachectic, ill-looking FDR resting his hand so he can shake. He can't even lift his hand. And here they are, sitting together for the photograph, historic photograph. And there's Stalin, very, feeling very comfortable on his home turf. Stalin's about to have his way with the Allies. So here we are. Enormous concessions are made. Over the next three days, Franklin Roosevelt is just too sick to argue. And he gives concession after concession after concession. And his decisions would be criticized for many years. 
Also, his actions may have been in unconstitutional. As a president, any international treaty needs to be ratified by the Senate. This was never done. He made unilateral, unilateral decisions um, which, uh, which reverberate again to this day. This was the birth of the Cold War. This led to the partition of Germany. Poland was given away. The whole Eastern Bloc was given away. Yugoslavia didn't need to be given away. Uh, Stalin was nowhere near it, but he gave it away. On the, on the other side of the world, Manchuria was given away. And uh, the support for Chiang Kai-shek, who was the president of China at the time, was withdrawn. And this led to the rise of the communist in China and Mao Zedong. So there are many, many things that happened as a result of, of this uh, treaty. The only thing that FDR got out of it was the Russians agreed to help on the Japanese front. But only three months after the, uh, the conclusion of the European theater. At that time, FDR had no assurances that the secret project in Los Alamos would uh, come to fruition. Everybody knew, including Stalin's own people, knew that FDR was sick. Churchill's own physician wrote in his diary that day, to the doctor's eye, the president, FDR, appears a sick man. He has all the symptoms of the hardening arteries of the brain in an advanced stage so that I give him only a few months to live. He was right. And so FDR goes back to America. For the first time, he addresses Congress sitting down. He can't even put, up the, uh, put on the charade anymore. He's just too weak. And he goes down to Warm Springs to the little White House, this uh, cottage that was built during his presidency, four-room cottage. This is his bed. He and Eleanor had, different, had separate bedrooms. And uh, um, Eleanor rarely made it down there. This is where presidential uh, business was conducted. <laughs> and then on April 12, 1945, while sitting in this chair and having his portrait, his portrait taken by Elizabeth Shumatov, at about 1 p.m., he said, I have a terrific pain in the back of my head. And he collapsed and quickly lost consciousness. Dr. Bruin, who was the cardiologist, was there. And blood pressure was very high. Uh, uh, he was unresponsive. His pupils were dilated. It appeared that he had suffered a hemorrhagic event in his brain. And so they call Dr. Dr. Pollen from Emory, and he races down. And by the time he arrives, about an hour and a half, two hours later, the president stops breathing, and they've lost a pulse. So Dr. Pollen takes out a long needle filled with adrenaline and administers adrenaline to the president's heart in an effort to revive him. This is not successful. Unknown to the public, Lucy Mercer Rutherford was there, and she was hur hurried away to avoid a scandal. And her presence was not known until 1965. So the president is dead, the next, and, uh, and the next president now is Truman. Only a few weeks later, Mussolini and Hitler are both dead. He didn't survive to uh, see that come to pass. And then a few, a few months later, on August 6, 1945, a bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. and two days after that on Nagasaki. Some historians have argued that the failures of Yalta made 
it necessary for the United States to drop the bomb. I'm not sure I agree with that, but it has been, you know, some historians have said that, and we, we, won't, we won't debate that, but it's something to, to contemplate. My next story is about LBJ. This is a better story. So LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, was the 36th president of the United States. He was born in Stonewall, Texas, and he exclaimed at a very early age that he wanted to be president of the United States. I think he was five or six when he made that statement, and he made it over and over and over. And uh, his start in politics was with the rural electrification system that FDR started. And um, he became secretary to a, congress, to a congressman, and then a congressman, and then a senator, and then the youngest Senate majority leader in 1955. Johnson was a master negotiator. He never took no for an answer. He had these Jedi mind tricks that he would use on, on his foes and allies alike. There was no saying no to, uh, to Johnson. And here this poor senator is getting molested. <laughs> he's all over him. He's grabbing his lapel. He's poking his finger at him. He's, uh, he's in his face. You see how far he's leaning back. He did this all the time. When he, want, when he needed to be, he was very polite, kind, obsequious sometimes. When he, need, when, when he didn't need to be, he was very rude, and, uh, and he would use anything he needed to do in his arsenal to get his way. Some have said that he was the best salesman that ever lived, one-on-one -on -one salesman that ever lived. So, while Senate Majority Leader, on July 2nd, 1955, it was a Saturday, he was out in rural D.C. in Virginia playing dominoes with some friends. He was overweight, he smoked very heavily, he drank a lot, he had a horrible family history. All the male members of the Johnson family died in their 50s of heart disease or heart failure. And so he was taken urgently to the U.S. Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. It so happens that the cardiologist on call was a 35-year-old chief of cardiology who had recently finished his training under Paul Dudley White at Mass General Hospital. It was uh, Dr. Hurst. So uh, Dr. Hurst is waiting for Johnson when he arrives. He examines him. He's doing the EKG. And Johnson is looking at this 35-year-old kid. And he looks at him as he's performing the EKG. And he says, what do you see? And Hurst very calmly is examining the long strip of EKG paper as it's coming out of the EKG machine. And he says, unwaveringly, without hesitation, you are having a heart attack. Johnson starts using the Jedi mind tricks on him. And he scowls at him, trying to intimidate Hurst. He didn't know he was messing with. <laughs> trying to intimidate Dr. Hurst. And he said, Johnson said, are you sure? And Hurst said, yes, I'm sure. And, John's, and, and Dr. Hurst would later state that it was, he was very lucky, it was very clear, inferior ST elevation MI. If there was any question, he might have been in trouble with, with, uh, with the Senate Majority Leader at the time. So, so this was the first of many tests that Dr. Hurst would have to endure from uh, Johnson. And so Johnson was hospitalized for six weeks with the standard therapy at the time. Johnson convinced him to, pardon, Hearst convinced Johnson to quit smoking and stop the drinking. He lost 60 pounds, which he kept off. I'd love to know how Hearst convinced him to do that. Um, and 
Hurst laid down the law. This is what we're going to do. He had rules, and Johnson would constantly try to bend them. For example, no radio was allowed. He didn't want the Senate Majority Leader to be upset and get his blood pressure up after having a myocardial infarction. And so Johnson negotiated a radio to listen to country music. So the radio was allowed, and Hearst would walk in sometimes, and Johnson would change the station. There was a visitor quota, no more than four visitors at a time with Johnson. And one day Hearst walks in, and there's a whole crowd of people. And Hearst was not shy about confronting him, confronting uh, Johnson. And he said, I thought we had an agreement. And so Johnson very slyly says, oh, come on, Dr. Hearst, you're not going to count Republicans now, are you? <laughs> but, but the bottom line is Hearst was not, could not be intimidated by this very intimidating man. And they built a relationship and friendship that lasted until Johnson's death long after his presidency in 1973. So Hearst would not clear Johnson to go back to the Senate. He wanted him to recover. He wanted him to take some time off. And so Johnson went to his ranch to take another four or five months off. In the meantime, Dr. Hurst had completed his military training in November of that year and uh, was discharged with commendation. And then he came here to, to Emory to join the faculty. Before he could go back, before, Her before Johnson could go back to the Senate, he came here to Emory to get, uh, to get an evaluation by Dr. Hurst. Dr. Hurst looked at his EKG. His EKG was now normal. His chest x-ray was normal in size. He had no symptoms, and he, he looked great. And so Dr. Hurst cleared doc, uh, uh, LBJ to go back to the Senate, which he did. Around that time, Emory was not the most hospitable place to work as a young uh, as a young doctor. And so Hearst was recruited to the Mayo Clinic to start the medical school up there. And finally, Emory gave him an offer he uh, could not refuse, and he was given uh, a professor of medicine at the age of 36 and was also chief of medicine at the age of, of 36, a position he retained until 1986 for 30 years. Johnson would later go on to be vice president on the Kennedy ticket in 1960. And then on one fateful day, on November 22nd, 1963, President Kennedy is assassinated. And Johnson takes the oath of office in Air Force One, which is, by the way, the first time he stepped foot in Air Force One. Kennedy couldn't stand Johnson, and, uh, and, uh, and the hatred between Bobby and, and Johnson was, uh, was uh, a thing of legends. But, uh, but this was the first time Johnson was on Air Force One, and here you see Jackie Kennedy in her bloody suit. He insisted that she be there to, to give him, an, uh, to give him uh, uh, some authority. Uh, because the 25th Amendment had not yet, just yet passed, which um, we'll talk about later, which talks about um, the accession after an, uh, uh, a president uh, is either incapacitated or is dead. Johnson becomes president, and Johnson pleads with Hearst to become his White House physician. He pleads and begs with, him, begs with him and does all the Jedi mind tricks to get him to leave Emory and come to, uh, to the White House. And he very politely but very firmly refuses on numerous occasions. He wanted to be here and build what we have here today. Next story is about the dangers of wishful thinking. And it's about... Dwight Ike Eisenhower, 34th President of the United States. So before becoming president during World War II, 
General Eisenhower was the supreme Allied commander of the Allied forces, and he coordinated Operation Torch, the liberation of Africa, and, uh, and Operation Overlord, the liberation of Europe. And then after the war, he became the uh, president of Columbia University, and then he, um, he was approached by both parties to become president in the 1952 election. Even Truman said he would be his running mate, and he would let Ike be, uh, Ike be uh, number one on the ticket. Um, Eisenhower decided that he wanted to be a Republican, and he ran for the Republican ticket and, uh, and won handily. He was probably the most experienced administrator ever in the White House. He brought an enormous staff with him that was very organized, very well-oiled machine. He was a master leader. He knew when to micromanage, when to pay attention to something, and he knew when to delegate something. And because of this, he had lots of time for golf. And he played more golf than just about anybody else. And then one day on September 24th, 1955, he was playing golf out in Denver. He was vacationing. He was visiting his in-laws, the Dowds, in Denver, Colorado. And he was, he was having a good day. That day, he had frequent interruptions. And this man had a ferocious temper, legendary temper. He was also a heavy smoker until a few years before in 1949 when he quit. So he had numerous interruptions. Uh, John Foster Dulles would not stop interrupting him. He was Secretary of State at the time, would not stop interrupting him on the golf course. Uh, every time he would, he would go out to, to, to play golf, he would be called back to the clubhouse. There were no cell phones at that time. He'd be called back to the clubhouse, and then by the time he got back to the clubhouse, Dulles was not on the line. So he was back and forth, and he became enormously frustrated, and his blood pressure went up, and he was very upset by, by all this, very animated. And he started to develop a little bit of chest discomfort. He sat down to have some lunch. He had a burger with onions, and, uh, and he enjoyed that. And then he had some what he thought was heartburn. And he didn't feel well, and he did not finish the, that round of golf. And so he retired to his in-law's house in Denver on Lafayette Street, John and El Elvira Dowd's house. And he had dinner. He had dinner with his doctor, Dr. Howard Snyder, who was a surgeon, an army surgeon. And he complained of the chest pain at the dinner table. And Snyder said, oh, it's heartburn. So, he, so Eisenhower retires, goes to bed. At about 2 in the morning, he wakes up with severe chest pain. He can't breathe. He is feeling awful. So Dr. Snyder is summoned. Dr. Snyder brings with him an oxygen tank and a bag full of medicines. And he goes upstairs to be with the president. He diagnoses a heart attack. He gives him heparin. At that time, it was bolus. It wasn't a drip. He gave him a heparin bolus. He gave him papaverin to dilate his heart arteries. And he also gave him inhaled, inhaled amyl nitrate. If, you know, you, you break a little thing and you, and you uh, take a whiff of the amyl nitrate instead of nitroglycerin. And he brought oxygen with him, and he put oxygen mask on the president's face. President was very ill, and he could not tolerate the mask. He was suffocated. He felt suffocated by the mask. And so president was feeling bad. So the next thing, doctor, at no point did it occur to him to call for help. He, at the next thing he did was he asked Mamie Eisenhower, Eisenhower's wife, to crawl into bed and to hold her husband to calm him down. The next morning, the president is feeling a little bit better, but now his blood pressure is low. And uh, he doesn't look good. He looks very gray, very pale. And so finally, at noon the next day, a cardiologist is called, Dr. Pollock from Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center. Called over, does an EKG, anterior ST elevations all over the place with Q waves. 
So the president is transferred over to Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center, and they call for help. They call Thomas Mattingly, who was also a student of Paul Dudley White at Massachusetts General, like Hearst, and succeeded Hearst to the chief of cardiology at the Naval Hospital in Bethesda. Dr. Madeline was very worried, so he called in, he called in the big guns, and he called in doc, uh, Dr. Paul Dudley White, who was both his mentor and Dr. Hearst's mentor. And so they treat him with the standard therapies of the day. A few days later, they see a bulge on his EKG, uh, pardon, a bulge on his um, chest X-ray, and a left ventricle aneurysm is diagnosed. And so warfarin, brand new drug, was administered by Dr. White. This was one of the first times that warfarin was ever used. Before this time, warfarin was rat poison. And so over the next few weeks, the next six weeks, the president's condition improves. He's treated with warfarin. He's not allowed to ambulate. He stays six weeks, and then he has a convalescence in his Gettysburg farm. And before having his heart attack, Eisenhower was adamant that he would not run for a second term. But during his convalescence, he got so bored that he wanted to run again. And so around this time is when LBJ had his miraculous recovery from his heart attack with normalization of his EKG. Paul Dudley White could make no such claim that Eisenhower's EKG was now normalized. So the teacher, White, calls his student, Hearst, and jokingly scolds him for showing him up uh, on, the, on the national stage. Eisenhower would be enfeebled for the rest of his presidency, and he would have a number of strokes during his presidency as well, despite being on warfarin. And his enfeeblement may have changed how he addressed civil rights, how he addressed, how he addressed, um, how he addressed a number of things, including the space race and, um, and also Middle Eastern foreign policy. Eisenhower and White would remain friends um, for the rest of Eisenhower for the rest of uh, for the rest of uh, their lives, and then Eisenhower would finally die in 1969, after multiple cardiac arrests at the uh, U.S. Naval Hospital. My favorite story is about a death of a princess. A princess, many of you may not have heard of. And this was Princess Charlotte of Wales. This was the pre-Victorian era. She was very popular. She uh, was almost like a modern Lady Diana, if you could make that comparison. And she married Prince Leopold, and everyone was very happy they were going to have an heir to the throne. And so soon she became pregnant. And her akushur, akushur means male midwife, usually not a physician, but in this situation, a physician, Sir Richard Croft, who uh, got his degree at Oxford, and was also a physician to the ailing, uh, allegedly mad King George III, who uh, squandered the American colonies um, because, maybe because of his illness with lead poisoning or porphyria. I'm not sure anybody knows. So Sir Richard Croft, no relation to Laura Croft, <laughs> he confines the princess to the Claremont House in the British countryside. And that was the standard of the time. And he was a very diligent doctor to his patient. He diligently bled her frequently to reduce congestion. And he diligently restricted her diet. And then she went into labor, a very prolonged, painful labor, 
without progression of the fetus. And he waited a full day to call for help. And finally, he called a Dr. Sims, a John Sims, to come and help him. Dr. Sims came in from London. He was an expert at cesarean section, as, as much of an expert as he could be at those days, a cesarean section and the use of forceps. They were there and they contemplated and they didn't know what, they weren't sure what to do and they decided to let nature take its course. Well, after 50 hours of labor, nature did take its course. A stillborn prince was born, and then a few hours later, the princess died of hemorrhage uh, and, uh, and likely infection. Everybody criticized the attending doctors. Why don't you use forceps? Why don't you at least save the air? Now we have no air. What is the British monarchy going to do? What are the British people going to do? So Dr. Croft had a breakdown. And he went away for a few months and then came back to practice. And then the first year anniversary of the death of the princess was just around the corner. And he was taking care of a lady by the name of Thackeray. He was delivering her in her house. Circumstances, timing, something reminded him of what happened with Princess Charlotte. So he retired to a private bedroom that was assigned to him during the delivery process. And he found two loaded pistols. And he shot himself simultaneously with both. This was what's called the triple tragedy, the death of the princess, the prince, and the doctor. Why do we care about this? This is Charlotte. This is King George. No heirs. So the uncles started racing to produce an heir. And the elderly Edward amended things with his estranged wife, and they produced someone you may have heard of by the name of Victoria. She would later become Queen Victoria. She had lots of kids and lots of grandkids. Her progeny would be the monarchs of Europe. They would later on divide and fight against each other during the First World War, including this guy here, William II, a.k.a. Kaiser Wilhelm II, who paradoxically had a short right arm because of the use of forceps. He had Herb's palsy. There's more. They were bleeders. There were a lot of bleeders in the royal families. The royal blood was bleeding blood. And the Prussian royal family, the Russian foreign family, and the Spanish royal family. No family was as impacted as the Russian family. Who knows what, a, what would have happened to the Russian monarchy had Alexis been healthy? Could the face of Russia or the world been a little bit different? Had Dr. Croft used forceps? Hard to know. My final story is about George Washington, who was the man who would not be king. George Washington was our first president. He survived many illnesses during his lifetime, including smallpox. His face was very pockmarked. No artist will ever show their subject as having pockmarked. He had horrible teeth and he used ill-fitting dentures. They were never wooden, that's just a myth. He used human teeth and animal teeth and ivory and he never smiled because of this and he limited his public speaking also because of it. This is his real hair, it's not a wig. He survived TB, he survived malaria, 
various bacterial infections even during his presidency. He had horrible dysentery during Valley Forge. And then he became the first president of the United States. And after his second term in office, he was feeling that he was a little bit, he was losing, he was losing his touch, he was losing some of his mental faculties, and so he decided to step down. He was offered to be king of America. There were many proponents to it, and he could have had it, but he obviously uh, wouldn't hear anything of it. Also, he never, he never had any children. There were no heirs to the president. And then when he finally stepped down, that was the first of 43 peaceful successions of power in this country. I think that's pretty unique and rare in the world. So after he retired from his presidency, he was up back at his estate up Mount Vernon. December 12, 1799 was a snowy day. And he was out and about doing what he enjoyed, riding his horse, supervising and doing things himself on his improving the grounds on Mount Vernon. And he was saturated. His clothes were saturated. His hair was saturated with water when he came back. And when he came back, he had uninvited guests. He always had uninvited guests, but he was always very courteous. And he would not make his guests wait while he went and changed. He sat immediately down at the dinner table with his moist clo clothes and then caught, caught what appeared to be a cold. The next day, it was very hard for him to swallow. He could barely breathe. He was bolt upright trying to breathe because he could not swallow, could not breathe. There appeared to be an obstruction right there. So doctors were called. And in those days, if you were short of breath, you got bled. So they bled him. And then he insisted on, on being bled again and again and again. And they said, no, no, we can't bleed you. No, we, we shouldn't bleed you. But they did it anyway. The patient insisted on a treatment. And the doctors agreed to administer that treatment, despite their better judgment. And later on, December 14th, the President George Washington died. Would he have survived what was probably epiglottitis? It's possible. I'm not sure in the grand scheme of things it really mattered a whole lot, but I'm not sure his doctors did him any favors. So to conclude, I wanted to go back to the VIP syndrome. And again, a VIP is a very intimidating patient, somebody who makes the doctor uncomfortable, somebody who makes the doctor, persuades the doctor, circumstances around this patient make this doctor go against their own medical judgment. Medicine, I'm very young as faculty, but medicine is not a precise science. Medicine is a series of judgment calls, weighing the benefits and the risks and alternatives of various medical treatments. So we rely on our medical judgment. If a doctor does not rely on their medical judgment, not sure what kind of doctor that makes them. So, so I will leave you again with this take home message. Do not let patience persuade you. Do not let circumstances persuade you against using your medical judgment. And again, I feel this is applicable to the patients we see every day, not to the rare VIP, a uh, very important person, uh, which is, uh, uh, should be replaced by a very intimidating person. I'd like to thank Matt Certain for his audiovisual genius. I'd like to thank Robbie Williams 
Dr. Clements, Dr. Larry Sperling, for their tremendous help in helping me formulate this. I'd like to thank David Morgan from the, uh, from the Department of English. Um, he, is, uh, he has a master's degree from uh, Columbia University uh, in both English and comparative literature and has been very helpful in trying to put this talk together in a formal way that, that, that makes sense. And I, I thank him for that. And I would like to thank my wife and son for putting up with me. These are some references. Please feel free to ask me questions or email me. Thank you. Great stories and a great message. Are there any uh, questions? Yeah, I, uh, it was an excellent presentation. I uh, was here and actually first at dinner at my parents' house. I got to know him well. And uh, I heard also stories about Eisenhower from Herndon, who uh, knew Woodruff closely. And there's one thing that I learned a lot from those people, those two people, first, and uh, turned in about Eisenhower and Woodruff, that there was at that time a tremendous connection between those people and poor people who couldn't get health care. Kurt told me he wanted to be a Grady and treat the poor people. He didn't want to just be up at the White House. He felt a need, but he wanted to make a difference in the lives of people who couldn't get health care. And Woodruff get, was friends with Eisenhower, and, and he was very, very concerned about the people on, with malaria on his plantation. And they agreed to start the CDC, right. which was the malaria center, for those poor people. Today, unfortunately, this is not the priority. We have ballet workers here, we have cafeteria workers, no health insurance, and uh, some of them you know, die and suffer. I wish that we could take the, the lessons from people like Kurt Eisenhower and so forth, who had a compassion for those people, and made that a priority. I think we should learn a lot from them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was a great, uh, great overview. Thank you a lot. Yeah, I mean, there are these, uh, these fascinating stories that. That was terrific. Thank you. That change, uh, change history. I mean, it really changes history. I have a million of stories.